Hello. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming tonight. And most importantly, thank you so much to eBay for hosting us. This is awesome. Every time I think I've seen a really cool space, then somebody comes and beats that other previously cool space. And I would say that eBay has done that tonight. So thank you so much for hosting us. We really appreciate this. <laughs> Every time that we do an event like this, we like to pitch more events. We want to see more of your friendly, smiling faces at all of our stuff. Last time we ran this slide, last night there was more things on here. We actually had four events this month. So we had two Hacker Days and two regular meetups. We are typically on a TikTok cadence, which means that you should expect to see another meetup like this in South Bay sometime in the March timeframe. Um, we are, as a leadership team, we are playing around with this. We might do a little bit more frequently or uh, hopefully not less frequently. But what we really want to do is maximize the value to you. So I think, you know, everybody can agree you don't want to be going to OWASP meetings like every week. But that being said, we have a lot of great speakers that want the opportunity and hosts that we would like to introduce you to. So we're, we're playing around with it, but you can expect at least every other month to be at hopefully a place that's as nice as eBay, uh, seeing talks as good as the ones we have tonight. We do have a code of conduct. It is not as long and wordy as some codes of conduct, but we take it extremely seriously. And basically it says, we want this to be an inclusive environment. If that ever stops being the case, then we will remove you. Uh, we have fortunately not had to do that yet, but we will if we have to. This is a, we want this to be a nice friendly group. We want this to be a place where everybody can come and feel comfortable. And as soon as that stops being the case, please find a leader. Uh, by the way, if you are an OWASP Bay Area leader, please raise your hand. I see Brendan. There, I'm sure there will be, yes, yes, thank you. Please introduce yourself, new leader. Oh, with food in your mouth, I'm sorry. This is not a great time. <laughs> we are very excited to have you here. Thank you so much for participating in our chapter. Uh, she just ran an amazing event last night in San Francisco, and given that she joined, I think, in December, like, awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, AppSec California, who's going? I need to see more hands. AppSec California, okay, who's been in the past? Okay, so this is the thing, right? AppSec California is a hidden gem of a conference. Here's the thing. We have spent a lot of time handcrafting the best talks, and we get them because it's right on the beach in Santa Monica. So you could not have a better place for a conference. You know, duty calls, you have to do it for work and all this, but then you also conveniently end up on the beach and you get to see a bunch of cool talks and you get to meet cool people. It's basically a win-win, and the tickets are very reasonably priced. If you looked at something like Black Hat, we're coming in at you know, maybe a quarter or less of that price. So in my opinion, it's the best bang for your buck of any security conference that I'm aware of. So hopefully, hopefully more people will reconsider, and I'll see some of you there. We are on social media, of course. Who's not these days? Uh, I have some people, I'm, I'm not very social media savvy, I'll admit, but we do have good leaders in the chapter that are able to help us. What I think might be interesting for the people here in particular is the YouTube channel. So what we try to do is have all of our talks recorded. We think that this provides a benefit to our members in that, a, oh, I, that, what was that thing that I heard the other day? And you can go and look it up. And it also provides a benefit to our speakers in that if you deliver a good talk, that should be collateral that you can point to. So our goal going forward is to have all of our talks recorded, and I would expect to see we will largely meet that goal. This is schedule. We are right on time. First, we're going to have post-incident review with Fairnac. Uh, post-incident review, the forgotten phase. I think you know plenty, plenty of people out there having incidents, but maybe we could be do a, uh, doing a better job learning. And then we're going to freak everybody out with a bunch of ways that your Android ecosystem's horribly broken. Is that a, is that a fair assessment, Serge? <laughs> uh, and finally, some threat modeling, which I'm actually very, very personally excited about because threat modeling is one of those things that when I try to explain, everybody gets why it's important and it's also extremely difficult to pull off at scale. So I'm expecting to learn a lot from this talk and I'm very excited. We would not be able to do all this without uh, the support of our sponsors. These people on the board have paid money to our chapter. Basically, they're supporting OWASP at a, uh, at, a at, a, sorry, at a global level. And then when they do that, they have the option of allocating funds to our chapter. 
Now, because of generous hosts like eBay, we actually don't need the money to host these events. What we typically do is we get sponsors that are willing to open their space to us for free. So where these funds come into play is when we do events like Day of Security. Day of Security is a, it's a mini conference, and the whole point is to encourage more women to get into the field of security. I think we can all agree, you know, the, those of us in the business can agree that we are desperately short on people and we are underutilizing very, very talented women. So Day of Security is all about encouraging more of that and we directly sponsor that with the funds that we take in from these generous sponsors. And then all of these ho great host companies. This is, this, these are the people that make events like this happen. Open their doors, welcome us, give us great food, give us a spot to have networking and these awesome talks. So, Highly appreciate all of the sponsors on this board. Tonight's host, of course, eBay, and I would like to uh, open the opportunity for them to say a few words. Um, they're probably hiring, everybody hires, right? Would you, like, would you like to say some words? Yep, he wants to say words, I can tell. Do you have the uh, microphone, Brendan? Yeah, <clears throat> perfect. Yeah. Oh, thanks everybody again for coming. Um, I'm on the um, <clears throat> red team, pen test team at eBay, and um, just want to let you know, I guess, you know, eBay, we take security very seriously. We have a lot of people here who are really excited about this kind of stuff. So um, if, if you're looking for a job, if that's the kind of environment that the kind of people you like to be, around, eBay is a good place, and um, just uh, really happy to have you all here, thanks. You will not find a group of people that take security more seriously than those that process money, so yeah. thank you for sponsoring us, we really appreciate it. And with that, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Farinac, who's going to teach us how to do post-incident response better. Thank you, Travis. Oh, you don't want this. Yes, thanks. Thank you. Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, what I'm presenting today I, are my personal experiences and they're not related to Uber. I'm not presenting Uber today. I just want to set it up first at the beginning. This is a map of the ransomware detections in 2019. They're not successful attacks, they're just the detected ones. Recorded Future published a record on May 2019 estimated 230 government systems they have been attacked since 2013. And some statistics on ransomware are the one I show in the slide, which is telling the average cost in a ransomware attack in a business is 133,000. 56% of malware attacks ended up to be a ransomware attack. Less than one quarter of a small and medium-sized businesses reported their ransomware attacks in 2018. 47% of businesses in the United States have been at affected by a ransomware at some point of their life. 59% of ransomware was delivered via phishing email, and 95% of ransomware profits are through cryptocurrency. Atlanta City was hit by Sam Sam ransomware on March 2018. They refused to pay the $51,000 ransom. Sam Sam ransomware basically used brute force for guessing their passwords. The attack knocked about one third of the city's 424 software programs offline, including their police department, which they lost great deal of criminal evidence, as well as their court system. The cost to rebuild Atlanta's computer network ended up being $17 billion. More than a year later, Baltimore was in the same situation. Maryland was hit by Robin Hood ransomware. It affected the real estate market, also impacted their system in hospitals, airports, ATMs, water billings, as well as traffic fines. The question is, how could it be 
that only one year later, and after so many ransomware attacks, Baltimore was caught unprepared. There are two specific reported reasons for that. Number one is their decentralized cost of their budget. Number two is failure to fund their cyber insurance. The past cases of ransomware could have provided opportunity for Baltimore to have an improved security posture. They had time to take proactive measures. They could have learned the lessons from, for example, having a business continuity plan, from managing patching and upgrading, from email protection, such as filtering, user awareness, endpoint protection. In these days, ransomware should be treated as an inevitable incident, and the preparation should reflect this. Malwarebytes suggested four steps to be prepared for ransomware attacks. Number one is identify what is your valuable data. Number two, segment that specific data. Number three, create a backup plan for that data. And number four, create an isolation plan for your search to respond to ransomware. Now that I showed you the statistics and convinced you that cyber attack is going to happen to every single of us today or tomorrow, let's talk what to do after these attacks are happening. Because you never want a serious crisis to go to waste. My name is Faranak Firozan, and I started my career as computer engineer. But my dreams took me to be anti-money laundering investigator with financial institutions, as well as wealth management. Currently, I'm working in the cyber um, security response team at Uber. Let's start our conversation with incident lifestyles. They're defined by various organizations. I've shown NIST, SANS, and CJCSM on the slide. They all include activities in identification phase, um, response phase, which um, include containment and eradication, as well as recovery phase. Also, all of them are showing an activity after the recovery phase, and they call it post-incident activity or lessons learned. I didn't include it ANISA in my slide because they didn't explicitly, explicitly uh, talk about the post-incident activity, but they talked about it in their last phase, which is conclusion phase. If any of us in this room, if we combine and simplify the objectives of the various frameworks that are out there, of their versions of the post-incident review, all of us are able to create an easily understandable process with measurable KPIs. If you look at all the frameworks that are listed above, they all says post-incident review has three phases. It's identification, improvement, and production. In the identification, we talk about the details of the incident, who was involved, what policy and procedures has been part of the attack, and what was the gap. In improvement, we talk about how we should improve the communication between our teams, how can, how can we train our employees, and how can we improve our process policy and, policy and procedures. And in the protection phase, we talk about how can we remove the vulnerabilities, how can we reduce the impact of similar incidents to happen to the business, and how can we reduce the likelihood of the similar type of the attack happen to the business. If I want to summarize, I say post-incident review is a process. It's a process of detailing the incident and providing an opportunity to identify the gaps in the business and to remediate the gaps in po our policies, procedures, and in general toward our security. Who should see the result of the post-incident review? I would say all of the stakeholders involved in the incident, they need to be part of the post-incident review. Going forward in the slides, I'm going to call post-incident review PIR. PIR contains three functions, identification, which is documenting and determining of the gaps, which I'm going to call them after action items. Another function is remediation, which is implementing actions to fill the gaps. And the last function is visibility, which is basically bringing meeting, conversations, Zoom, emails, chats, whatever, to all of the stakeholders involved to bring visibility to everyone. 
there are three benefits to PIR. Number one is improving policy and procedures. Number two is reducing risk. And number three is bringing unity to all of the cross-functional teams. I want to make sure we are all on the same page, that there is a fine line between improving the policy and reducing the risk. I define that an after-action item is an improvement of a policy if it's not tangibly attributable to the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of a system. On the other hand, risk-based action items have more tangible effects on the security posture. These can include activities such as updating the access control list or enforcing multi-factor authentication. When we complete such actions, we are effectively reducing the overall risk for the organization. Another benefit of PIR was bringing unity to our, the cross-functional teams of the organizations. Meeting, meetings and open communication channels between the teams, causing teams to share knowledge to find optimal solution. This is toward promoting a, a culture change toward continuous improvement, rather than one team providing a low effort, quick fix. All of the teams are getting together to purposefully talk about finding the best options. When I talk about promoting a cultural change, it's, it can be a little bit hard, or it can be it, it, it might probably need a little bit push, and I want to offer to add some incentives toward your employees to do that push for you. That incentive can be, for example, you can add an electronic badge to the name of a special employees in your internal, basically, chart of your organization. Or you can send out recognition through emails. Or you can have team nomination for the most improved process. PIR in general is a collaboration between incident management, incident response, mixed teams, and upper management. Different teams will have different priorities, resources, and budgets, obviously. And PIR should be developed to have minimal impact on regular business operations while prioritizing the critical work items. The key areas that can create obstacles toward this PIR program are administratives, incident management, documentation, communication, and after-action item management. In the administrative and organizational challenges, it can be lack of leadership or economic incentives, which can prevent the buy-in process for the PIR. Other problems involve lack of incident tracking and lack of employee engagement, because there is always people that they think PIR is just that extra work, or it's too much time consuming to be putting together all these cross-functional teams and keep providing feedbacks to them. This can be an obstacle. Other challenge that can reduce the effectiveness of implementing PIR is incident tracking and incident handling. If they are done inaccurately, especially when you're evaluating a severity of an incident, that can either put us in a wrong path, that we, are, we ended up doing PIR for an incident which is not severe, so we are wasting the time, or we completely miss doing PIR for an incident which has been severe but inaccurately categorized in their severity. For the documentation, sometimes the root cause of an incident has not been um, figured out correctly. If the root cause is not figured correctly, is not identified to be a correct root cause, then in our PIR path, we are going to again waste our time because we are looking on a different cause, on a different gap, and we are completely missing what has been the real true gap. And the, it's suggested to use the five whys approach to find out the correct um, root cause of the incident. Also, shortcomings in the communication during PIR can lead to ineffective results. Until a culture shift is achieved in your organization, it's suggested that a dedicated sub-team in the CERT should take the responsibility to guide the PIR process and take charge of a scheduling and keeping conversations on track to make sure all of the gaps and after-action items are going forward. And also, after action item management, there might be a gap that you identify, but because the change management has not, has not been done correctly, 
that identification can cause to be a new vulnerability or new risk to our, your business. For example, let's imagine there is a vulnerability found in the current version of the software running on a router. A PIR after action item can be to run a new patch. However, change management is not being done um, correctly, and the new patch ended up to be not compatible with the previous conversation, um, with the previous configuration, causing network connectivity issues. So you see how a PIR after action item can cause to be a new risk or a new vulnerability to your business. In any case, when you're doing the PIR process, you need everybody in the involved, they need to have the end in their mind. All of the expectations need to be set and needs to be clear, and all of the deliverables needs to be in alignment with the expectations for the budget, for the time, for the resources, and for all of that. So I want to pause for a second here. So what did, and let's recap what I covered so far. I covered um, how close a cyber attack is to all of us and how possible it has happened to any of us. Why do, we need, why do we need a PIR program? What are the PIR functions? What are the PIR benefits? What are the PIR obstacles? And I kind of suggested that if until your, the culture shift happen in your organization, you assign a PIR team as a sub-team of your certs. So at this point, I want to say, let's say you have your PIR team all put together. After you have the team together, they only need to follow four very simple steps to run the process. And those steps are, number one, meet with the CERT members involved in the incident. You set up meetings, you put everybody in the room, and then you talk about what happened in the incident, what process and policies went wrong, what are the gaps, and what are the root cause of the incident, what was the impact of that, how did we mitigate the incident, and what did we miss. So this is the first step. The second step is you create a roadmap toward filling those gaps. So you take a pause and you say, these are the lessons we learned from this specific incident. And number three is, you need to find the right team to take the ownership to fixing that gap. So, and this brings accountability and responsibility to the stakeholders of the incident. And the last step is you need to set up a whole PIR meeting and involve all of the stakeholders that were part of the incidents, and then you talk to them saying, this is what happened, this is our, these are the gaps we identified, these are the owner teams, owning teams, and this is the roadmap for us to fix this problem, and this is the timeline that we have to fix this problem. A PIR program basically brings all the teams involved to get together. And what, what does it cause this to happen is a consistency between the teams. And for that, there needs to be a common vocabulary of terminologies and categorization between all of the different teams involved. For that, I'm going to walk you through a scenario that in my scenario, blue team, red team, and rest team are, are involved. So I want you to see how they need to come up with a common incident reporting framework. Let's say, if you look at the incident framework, it usually involves an indicator which has an attacker with some attributes and objectives. It has the attack itself, which has an action and a specific target. They use some methods and tools. They have a vulnerability in mind. There is a result, and there is a reaction from the organization. If the event is adverse, there will be some result that needs a reaction. The incident response team, the blue team, needs to be able to consistently report on these attributes. Depending on the scope of the incident, a detailed root cause analysis, that RCA that I put in front of the blue team, is root cause analysis. It might be needed by the blue team. This includes the details on the threat, the attacker, the tools they used, and what was the vulnerability that caused it, this incident to happen in general. Sometimes a red team needs also to be involved. They engage a target, they use tools to find vulnerabilities and subsequently exploit them, and their activities will tr trigger some events and it has some consequence or some results. 
There are also components of an incident that relate directly to risk analysis. An attacker represents a threat in the language of risk. What is risk? Risk is the likelihood that a threat will exploit a vulnerability of an asset and cause some impact to the incident. At this point, we all agree that all of the teams involved in my example, blue team, red team, and risk team, they need a common language to report to the leadership. Okay, they learned these lessons about this incident, how they can start reporting to the leadership. For that, they need to have a common framework to report this incident. There are numerous standards exist to report incidents, and their vocabulary can be used as an inspiration for your organization to define your own language. You don't need to start from the scratch. For example, in my mm, scenario, they, had, they were blue team, red team, and risk team involved. I personally would use the NIST category, MITRE ATT&CK, and MITRE CWE to create a common language between blue, red, and risk team to be able to talk to my leadership and tell them what happened. Now that all the teams are involved, they have a common frame to report on the incident. The question is basically how we need to present to leadership. And I'm gonna get there, but before getting there, it's very needed for all of, for all of the teams involved to have a very scope that basically shows what is the overlap between the teams. And it changed from scenario to scenario. For example, if PIR reporting wants to focus on quantitative and qualitative reports of the risk measurements, then their overlap of the PIR and risk is more than PIR and blue team or the red team. So how all of these teams need to get together to talk or present their data to leadership, I would say they can use metrics. Metrics, basically, it's very important to adopt for the business a platform that track PIR activities that allows for both recording relevant information and extracting data easily. So the keyword here is that needs to be easy to use because a useful metrics needs to be in an understandable language. It also needs to allow business to define their risk areas, and it needs to clarify perceptions of risk. M metrics can um, be informative. They can show impacts of the incidents. They can provide quantitative and qualitative data, and they can allow for, re for root cause analysis. These are the two my personal favorite type of the metrics, they, they are mock-up basically metrics, this is not real data, but the metrics in red and blue is showing each team, how much each team contributed toward improving policies and procedures in the blue or and toward controlling the risk toward the business in the red. The metrics in green is showing a relationship between the assets of the business and the needs categories. For example, it says the personal data needs the most attention in regards to the protection phase of needs category. This will give leadership um, basically visibility to make the decisions, where do they need to hire? Where do they need, where are the systems that has been on the target in the most recent one? If we maintain the historical data, we can have trends. And accurate information from this meaningful breakdown of the trends can cause to the actionable metrics. Because most of the times, the questions that I face from leadership are, they keep asking, are we seeing more incidents in a particular category recently? Or they ask, why is that? What systems has been the target recently? Which teams owns those systems? Which teams owns the configuration of, of those systems? And I believe the PIR uh, and the PIR data is able to answer these type of questions to the leadership. Um, and if I want to look at some examples of the lessons learned from the most significant security incidents we had very recently, I can say Equifax showed us the importance of patching. NSA showed us how important it is for us to prevent the data loss. 
And the data airlines breach showed us it's very necessary for every business to have a third party security assessment. At this point, I probably there are some questions in your mind and I wanna go over some of the most frequent questions that I personally was getting. People ask me, which incidents require PIR? I say, basically, a PIR should occur whenever there is a meaningful opportunity for applying lessons learned. This usually follows from a severe incident, as we don't want to, we don't want a similar severe incident happens to us again. There are other opportunities that we need to also consider, such as the complexity of the incident or novelty of the incident. You might ask, when should you start PIR after an incident happened? I say there is no set time that you must um, basically start a uh, post-incident review, but SANS suggests within two weeks of the incident occurrence. I say sooner is almost always better because when the incident is fresh, stakeholders remember the details better and they're able to identify the gaps and opportunities to learn the lessons. You might ask who should be involved. I would say it dif it's different from the, at the, from the different stages. When you are at the stage of documenting and identification, you need to involve all of the CERT members that they were involved in the incident. You need to involve your legal team, you need to involve your comms team, incident management, incident response, they all need to be in that very first meeting. And when you're assigning the gaps or the after action items to the owning teams, definitely your meeting has to be with the owning team because you're assigning them and you want them to take this responsibility and to give you a roadmap and a time frame to fix the problem. When you're having the very end PIR meeting to let all of the stakeholders what happens, obviously you wanna have all of the stakeholders involved plus all of the management, plus legal and comms team, because you wanna tell them this is what happened, this is what we learned, this is the gaps we identify, and this is the roadmap and the time for us to fix the problem. And these are the references I used, and I wanna wrap up my presentation by this quote. It says, when we are not, at, one po at what point do we become? And the answer is, we don't until we learn lessons from what went wrong. So I think we have a couple minutes for questions. If there is any question, I would be happy to answer. Coming. Thanks. Hi, I'm Mark. Um, so the question is, of course, it's nice to learn from your own mistakes, but is there any way to learn from others' mistakes and what information would you share for the PIR with other teams? Yeah, with other teams, actually, that's a very good question. The, I, 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 think, I, think business, I think the security teams between the different businesses are not yet there to set up, to, to get together and talk about their internal incidents because it's a very, very uh, sensitive subject. However, within the company, we are having actually, I suggest, not we, but I suggest to have like some quarterly meetings with different stakeholders from different teams. And I do that through running tabletop exercises. So I take a real incident with whatever happened as much as possible and I run tabletops and I involve related teams or the teams that I think maybe next incident they would be involved. And then I run a couple hours tabletop for them. Yeah, sure. Um. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Um, on the prevention side, right, you probably would start with uh, building up an inventory of all the assets that you have, uh, but surprisingly, uh, enterprises that have thousands and tens of thousands of assets actually don't know how many assets they have. What has been your experience in that respect? Have you ever been conf confident about, okay, we, ex we know pretty much exactly our asset base, our inventory, and we can identify accurately what vulnerabilities we have and what kind of impact uh, any asset breach might have on our organization. Yeah, thank you for question. It's actually very, very to the point because 
per my um, experience, most of the incidents that happen, we don't have any idea, as you mentioned, that where are our assets. Like we see, for example, sometimes that the assets exist in the network, but they are not part of MDM, let's say, for example, as an example. And that can be a really good post incident for the businesses to bring on new softwares and bring on, have some policies for all of their mobile, especially mobile devices these days, um, to create an asset management at the very first step. But I have seen so many incidents happening because organizations, they don't know that they have this asset as part of their network because that, has, that asset has never been part of their MDM. Um, which is very interesting, but there is a saying that says you cannot measure, you cannot manage what you cannot measure. So if you don't know this asset exists in your network, obviously you can't manage it. So if we want to do backward engineering, is going backward and start from the beginning. Let's start figuring out where is all asset, and I. Th I I think there are so many software out there that they can do that for the organizations. It's just about taking the steps and the time to get there. So you spoke a lot about post-incident review, but I feel like a lot of it was at the enterprise level. So. This is the Bay Area, and there are a lot of startups here. When you're selling to an investor audience rather than an audience who has already made the commitment, how would you approach that differently? I feel, especially with the startups, I would say, like it seems, to my understanding and to my experience, it seems everybody are very busy defending their first building you know, their business, and after their building, they keep, you know, being at the stage of defending against this incident or that incident that happens. And they don't spend the time to stop and learn what happened in the past or from that incident or from similar type of the companies. So this, I, I mostly talked about post-incidents because I basically personally don't see that happen so much. Like engineers are so much wrapped up in building and building and building. And um, this phase is completely kind of forgotten. That let's just stop, go back, and learn from our lessons. So I was wondering, are there any, you were talking about metrics earlier, um, are there any key challenges like you've come across along the way with gathering metrics, valuable metrics? Yes, actually, translating the data of the post-incident to something to be measurable and meaningful for leadership has been the most difficult challenge because, for example, the data that PIR gives us is okay, this many incidents happened, this many gaps identified, this many gaps has been covered, but how can we translate the language towards measuring the risk? Because that's what the higher level leadership cares about because they are like, okay, so what? This many incidents, so what? This many gaps has been filled out, so what? So they keep asking, so what? So in my personal experience, was the best thing is at the very, very earliest stage, get together with the risk team of that business and understand what are their metrics to measure risk toward that specific organization and build the PIR program in a way that talk the risk language. So um, then when you figure out there is an after action item, you are able to categorize it that, okay, this action, after action item is targeting this asset and is having an impact in this specific risk of the company. So having an asset list, which is, which is in alignment with what risk team has, you know, basically those assets, is very important. And having the same language of the risk team of your organization in my experience was the key. Because other than that, the data that you gather for PIR is meaningless for leadership. So um, did I answer your question? Yeah, okay, thanks. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Farnak.
Next up, Serge is going to tell us about 50 ways to leak your data. I'm pretty sure there's more than 50, but we're just going to stay with 50 for tonight. By the way, if anybody wants to speak at any of our meetups, especially in the South Bay, come up and talk to me or Travis afterwards. We'll get you signed up. I'm looking at you, Delina. <laughs> Not Lena, Delina. There's a Delina and a Lena here. Okay, uh, I guess I'll, I'll jump right in. So I'm Serge Eggelman. Uh, so this is actually a, a talk uh, that was previously given at Usenix Security this year, um, well, I guess last year now, on uh, work that my startup, AppCensus, has been doing to look at uh, circumvention of the Android permission system. So uh, we've existed for a little under a year now. This is a spin-off of my research lab at UC Berkeley. And so this work is with a, a bunch of others um, from AppCensus as well as other academics. So the permission system. Both mobile platforms uh, prompt the user when apps ask for sensitive data. Ostensibly, this is to support the notice and choice framework that we have in the US, whereby users can um, be pre presented with notice of a company's privacy practices and then make a choice as to whether or not to allow or uh, deny those behaviors. And so, you know, the, these, the permission system governs access to some sensitive data on your phone, such as your location data, you know, your contacts, um, but most importantly, persistent identifiers, um, which are you know, generally used for the long-term tracking. Um, and so the question is, does this actually work in practice? So for several years, uh, my group has been developing instrumentation for Android. Um, and I, I pick on Android throughout all of this just because it's open source. So we have the source code. We can add instrumentation, uh, compile our own version, and then examine what apps actually do with sensitive user data. And so the way that we've gone about this is uh, we have a fork of Android where we've hooked every single one of the permission checking APIs so that as soon as an app tries to access data that's protected by the permission system, we can log that. We can also do other stuff too, but for, for this purpose, we just log it. Uh, several years ago, there was another project going on at the Institute um, where uh, another group was looking at um, user space network monitoring tools. And so they released this tool called Lumen, which runs in user space on Android and is basically a traffic monitor. It creates a VPN interface. Um, and basically allows uh, anyone to intercept traffic from apps on their phone to see where that traffic is going. So we combine these two projects um, to basically build an end-to-end -end test bed um, whereby we can run apps under our instrumented version of Android to see what data they access, and then using the network monitoring tools, we can see ultimately where that data gets sent. And so that's allowed us to do a bunch of studies to look at you know, whether certain types of data are collected by apps, um, and then you know, with whom they're sharing those, those data. Data. And so this requires several different steps. So the first is you know, downloading lots of Android apps so that we can then run them um, under our instrumentation to see what happens. Um, we then need to actually run those apps, um, which isn't always an easy process. And then afterwards, you know, with the logs, you know, the traffic flows, as well as our uh, instrumentation about what protected APIs were accessed, um, we take all that and then you know, parse it to see you know, ultimately what happened. And so you know, the first problem is you know, after we've scraped the store and downloaded lots of apps, we need to actually run those. Um, we're not doing static analysis where we're just scanning the code to see what functions are present and might be called under some circ circumstances. But instead, you know, in practice under actual usage, what actually does get called. 
Um, and so, you know, the, the first solution when this was just a university research project, we hired a couple undergrads to play lots of games. Um, and then we compared that to the, the Exerciser Monkey, which is a tool that comes with the Android tools, um, which is designed for basically fuzzing the UI. It generates random UI events such as taps, clicks, swipes, and so forth. And ultimately what we found was that for the, the 500 games that were played by both the monkey and the, the undergrad, uh, we got equivalent code coverage in more than 60% of them. And so for our purposes, we deemed the monkey uh, fairly effective. And most of this um, was due to the fact that when running an app, most of the, you know, privacy-sensitive behaviors, such as sharing data with third parties, that often just happens as soon as the app is run before the user even does anything. And so that's why the monkey is actually fairly effective at uncovering these behaviors. And so using all these tools, we've essentially built a click farm um, in, in the office. We've now transitioned this um, to the startup, and it's a, it's a lot bigger. Um, but basically, we have an end-to-end -end test bed using all of these phones, which are daisy-chained together. We're constantly pushing apps to. Um, and so we run apps under our, you know, test bed, we have simulated user interactions from the monkey, um, and that all goes into a re results database, which you can then search for particular apps. Um, and so we have free data online. If you go to search.appcensus.io, it'll show you uh, dynamic analysis in terms of what uh, third parties were contacted, what data they received, and what permissions were actually used during te testing as opposed to permissions that were just requested and might not have been used. Um, but what I'm talking about today is um, how we've been using this to uncover lots of outright deceptive practices. Um, so, you know, as is the case with physical world security mitigations, um, when, you know, security impediments are, are imposed, often uh, people find ways around them. And obviously, in computer security, there are many parallels to this. So, you know, one that comes to mind um, would be the side channel. So a side channel is basically, you know, you have a, a, an app that has, you know, is trying to access some data. There's a security mechanism that prevents it from accessing that data. Maybe it finds another way of accessing the same data um, you know, that circumvents the security mechanism. So that's a side channel. There are also covert channels. So here maybe you have you know, app one is a legitimate app with access. You know, the security mechanism grants it access to the resource. App two, uh, it doesn't grant access. But then app one could collude with app two to share the information anyway. And that's, that's a covert channel. And so using the data that we've been accumulating, um, we decided to try and detect whether we can, you know, uh, w w whether there would be any, you know, evidence of side or covert channels in the data set. Um, and then, you know, once we detect evidence of them, then we go in for a closer look and manually evaluate. And so the way that we've been doing this is uh, we have a corpus of apps. Um, we have a machine that can do, you know, basic static, you know, we do basic static analysis on those apps without running them. We can just scan the code to see what permissions are declared and what API calls are, are present um, so that we can decide, you know, whether an app hasn't requested access to certain data types. Um, so that then, during dynamic analysis, when we're running lots of apps and observing what data they're actually sending, um, we can then compare the PII that's been sent out with what the app actually had permissions to access um, and see what remains. And what remains, well, those are you know, what we call the apps that cheat, apps that are accessing certain sensitive data types that they aren't supposed to have access to. Um, and so all of this up until this point is completely automated, but then when we detect, you know, apps that are cheating, that's when we start reverse engineering them. Um, and by and large, you know, that's where we end up finding lots of different side and covert channels. And so to give an example of this in practice, um, you know, what I've just explained with this chart makes it sound, you know, very methodical, but actually the reason why this actually started was I was doing a query uh, about a year ago um, to look at apps that don't have location permissions um, and then apps that are transmitting location data. And, you know, these sets should theoretically be disjoint. Um, they were not. We found over a thousand apps that were transmitting location data without, you know, the, the permission to access said data. Um, you know, at first I assumed it was a bug in, in the code. Um, it turns out I was wrong, and it was actually more interesting than that. So, you know, not all 1,300 of these apps were actually 
uh, you know, exploiting different side channels, we found that one of the issues here with location in particular is that uh, a lot of the GeoAP databases have gotten uh, much more accurate uh, than, it, than we had expected. Um, so in uh, a, a, some percentage of these cases, uh, it, it was just due to GeoIP lookups that were extremely accurate, um, that were as precise as the GPS location. But in other cases, it was actual side channels. So, you know, one example is uh, the Android APIs protect access to sensitive data when the data is requested through the Android API. The problem is when the same data exists on the file system and is world readable, an app that's denied access, you know, when it legitimately tries to get it through the API, could then just try and open up the, the data on the file system without having the permission. Um, and we found, in fact, this is the case. So, you know, the PROC file system has a lot of information about the system. Um, and in versions of Android up until, I believe, 10, uh, it's mostly world readable. And so one of the things that we found is the ARP table, which has the address of the upstream Wi-Fi router, uh, which could be used to triangulate location. In fact, access you know, to the, the BSSID is regulated by the permission system, but nonetheless appears in plain text you know, in the ARP table on the PROC file system. And we found apps that are actually accessing it. So here's a, um, an SDK, OpenX. Um, it checks, you know, it calls is permission granted on the access Wi-Fi state permission, which is the permission that protects access to the BSSID. Um, when that fails, it jumps to this function called device MAC address from ARP, um, which um, does as you would expect. It opens up the PROC file system and just reads it from there. And so this seems pretty blatant, right? It tries to do it, you know, get the data legitimately. It even checks to see if it has the permission to access the data. A and then when it doesn't, it just goes, you know, through the side channel to get the same data anyway. Um, and we found that, you know, th this is fairly common. Uh, so under dynamic analysis, um, you know, these are the, uh, the apps that we actually observed um, engaging in the behavior. Um, and, you know, these correspond to millions and, you know, possibly billions of installs across all of the apps in the data set that are grabbing this location without permission. Um, Another one that we found was uh, grabbing the BSSID by connecting to the router directly. So we found uh, one app, the Peel Smart Remote, um, just opens up a socket uh, and you know, tries to guess at what the router is on the local network and then collect, uh, connects to the UPnP uh, port and reads the BSSID right off of that, which is creative. Um, Another one that we found um, is the, uh, the phone state and identity permission, which protects the IMEI. Um, I'm going to get into that in a little bit more detail in a bit with another one. Uh, but uh, Salmon Ads and Baidu um, are, are collecting this. And so what they do is write it to the shared file system when the app has the permission. Um, and when the app doesn't have the permission and has this SDK, then it checks this spot on the file system to see if another app um, had previously written it there. And so that's how they collect the IMEI. MEI without permission. Uh, MAC address of the, the local um, uh, the, the, the Wi-Fi uh, interface on the device. Uh, since Android 6, that's been uh, prohibited from being collected. Um, and so we were surprised that apps are still sending that. And you know, that basically comes down to native C++ libraries. Um, and those, you know, those are outside of the, the Android permission system. And so uh, I'm going to go into the detail of this in a little bit. Um, and then, you know, EXIF data. So um, apps have access to the photo library, which is just on the shared file system on the device. Um, those fo you know, the, the photos might have GPS coordinates, so an app that doesn't have access to the location permission, um, we found opening up and scanning EXIF data to collect location coordinates and sending it back to its server. So sorry, this was out of order. Um, so this is the, the Baidu case with IMEI. So it has this file um, that it writes. And when we first saw this, you know, it looks just like uh, base64 there. We decoded it, and it's you know, binary. And so that's when we you know, reverse engineer more and look in the app. And sure enough, um, they're just doing AES. Um, and uh, the, the key is right in the code. Um, it's backwards, but uh, you know, Baidu, CID, and I guess they've maybe been doing this since 2012. Um, and so when you decrypt that using the key that they have in their code, it gives you the device ID, um, the, the IMEI, and some other information. Um, we found, um, so you know, once we detect 
these uh, from the reverse engineering, then it's just a matter of creating a fingerprint for that particular exploit code, so then we can scan our whole corpus of apps to see how prevalent it is, even if we only saw that snippet of code being executed by you know, one app, we can see you know, how many apps have, have that same code. And so um, just searching for this particular encryption key of the, the 80,000 apps we tested this on, uh, we found 153 had the encryption key. Um, 73 of them actually sent the IMEI to, to Baidu, um, and 20 you know, didn't have the permission to do so. Um, so going back to the Unity, um, so what's happening here is Unity has native C++ code, uh, which basically just calls an ioctl, um, which is you know, a system API, um, which has the MAC address. Um, and so while the MAC address you know, isn't supposed to be accessed since Android 6, which was released, what, four or five years ago, um, we found over 12,000 apps that, w that had the code to do this, and over seven or 700 of them were actually transmitting. Uh, the, the MAC address to Unity. And so, you know, the conclusion with all this is that almost all of these behaviors are due to third-party SDKs, and I suspect that in most of the cases, the actual app developers probably had no idea that any of this information was being collected by these third parties. Um, and so, you know, the, the main conclusion is, you know, you might not have written all the code, code in your app, but you're nonetheless responsible for it. And so, you know, this month is a good time to reiterate this because these companies all have privacy policies and are now you know, liable for correctly stating what data is, uh, is collected. Um, and so you know, the other point, though, is that determining the privacy practices of your mobile app is a lot more than just looking at what permissions were requested by the app or what SDKs happen to be bundled into it. Uh, unless you know what those SDKs are actually doing, um, it's, you know, it, 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 these, these other signals are, are actually pretty weak in terms of what the privacy behavior of the app actually is. Um, and, you know, and, and this is because the Android system only protects access to certain types of personal data, um, which also exists on the file system in many cases. Uh, so we reported all of this to Google uh, about a year ago. We first disclosed this at Usenix in August. Um, and Google released Android Q about two months later. And so a, a lot of these issues have since been fixed in the, in the most recent release. Um, but what's discouraging about all of this is that there are periodic you know, over-the-air fixes for security um, issues. Uh, when security issues are, are, are detected, uh, a fix is offered over the air uh, for, for many people who have Android. Um, whereas with you know, major privacy vulnerabilities, in this case, you have to wait for the next major release of Android to actually address them. And so contrary to you know, Google's position that privacy shouldn't be a luxury good, um, to actually have a phone where these issues are addressed, you have to you know, spring for a new device that'll actually run Android 10, which most, you know, most consumers uh, have much older devices that don't get over-the-air updates anymore. And certainly, you know, to be able to apply these privacy fixes, uh, that's concerning. Uh, since we have a couple other a couple minutes, I was going to show some other fun findings um, that we've seen. Um, so we've seen a lot of interesting obfuscations now. Uh, so you know this is this is pretty obvious. Um, we have you know base sixty four you know transmitting the data. Um, here, does anyone want to guess uh, how this is encoded? The 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 key are the t last two characters. <laughs> So if you've seen a lot of Base64 encoded JSON objects, um, they usually begin with EY, which is the, the, you know, the, the opening bracket. And so this is Base64 backwards, or what we're calling the 46 ESAB encoding, um, where they're, you know, and, and again, all of the data that they're collecting is totally violating Play Store policies about collection of identifiers and user tracking. Um, but you know, I guess they feel they can get away with it because they Base64 encode it and then flip flip the string around. Um, other interesting things, uh, so here is the, the IMEI being sent in plain text, uh, followed by an MD5 of it oops, twice, uh, SHA-1 twice, SHA-256 twice. Um, same thing with the Android ID. You know, since you know, they have the, the, the unencoded version, I guess I don't know why they need to get every conceivable hash of it. Um, so that, that's interesting. Uh, keys in source, pretty prevalent. Um, this is Iron Source, another ad library. Uh, bad keys in source, this was a fun one. Um, so here, 
you know, this looks like base 64, but it decodes to, you know, nothing comprehensible. Uh, but nonetheless, this wasn't actually binary, which, you know, made it, uh, you know, suggest that something more was going on here. And so, you know, looking, you know, looking through the decompiled app, we see, so this is the start app SDK. Um, they take the location coordinates, then, in, then XOR it with encryption key, encryption key, encryption key, uh, then XOR it with uh, start app, start app in, in leap speak, and, and that's how, you know, they transmit the location coordinates. Why? I don't know. <laughs> um, Incompetent sharing of PII. So uh, this came up a while ago, uh, where I was looking through our database, and uh, we noticed that the CVS app was sharing location data with 40 some different third parties. Um, which, you know, again, I thought there's got to be some sort of bug in our parsing scripts. Um, but in fact, what was happening was um, someone had the great idea. So the, the CVS app is, inter is basically built as a series of web views. The entire app is, you know, different pages that are being, you know, pulled down in the app. Um, and they're passing, you know, passing location coordinates as the user agent string. They just throw the, you know, throw it onto the end of the user agent string, which means that any third party content that's loaded on the, the page pages in the web view all are also getting location coordinates. Um, so yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I spent, you know, another lesson here is having uh, technical contacts uh, readily available on your website, because after discovering this, I spent about an hour trying to find a technical contact at CVS and finally gave up and just emailed customer service. And so they delightfully responded saying that, uh, you know, we apologize, however, we do not share your location information with any third parties. Um, clearly not understanding the issue. And so then when CNET covered it, they quietly fixed it. So um, we, we blog about a bunch of these things as we find them. Um, and I guess I'll just leave it at that. Thanks. Questions? OK, you were first. Uh, thank you for a good presentation. So my question is, have you ever take a look at the code? That code, I mean, exfiltrating code is belong to main application or advertisement libraries? Sorry, Adver advertisement libraries or main code of the application? Because what was the first part of the question? <laughs> Sorry. So mostly, most of these kind of behaviors, especially exfiltration behaviors, I'm assuming that uh, advertisement libraries doing these kind of behaviors. Yeah, it's mostly ad and analytics SDKs yeah. that are doing it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So I have an Android phone, and I have apps on them. What do you recommend? I mean, you know, not using the phone isn't obviously, a, you know, a, a reasonable answer. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I think it's just the main thing is that, you know, consumers need to be a lot more cognizant. Well, I think that fundamentally the issue is consumers are burdened with, you know, you're coming at this from the consumer perspective right now. And, you know, consumers have these, you know, realist, you know, un totally unrealistic responsibilities that they're burdened with for trying to determine all of this. And so, you know, the only way that we've figured out that this stuff is happening is through doing deep packet inspection, uh, which you can't do on, on current versions of Android. And so instead, we're doing this all at the OS level. Um, and so it's, you know, it's not realistic to expect the average user to fork the Android OS, add instrumentation so that they can figure out whether an app is actually, you know, keeping their data securely or not. And, you know, and so that's why I think that, you know, developers need to step up. And ultimately, you know, the, the incentives are going to come from um, above, you know, from enforcement actions. So if I go to search appsenses.io, will I be able to just enter in the apps I have and see if you yes. have any data? Yes. <laughs> Yes. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So on the the free website, we show a summary of the types of data um, that were transmitted to which third parties and which which permissions we observe being used. Um, and then on the uh, uh, mostly we have enterprise customers, so we we have free st free stuff for consumers to find stuff out. And then uh, mostly we're working with enterprises and regulators. Um, to do, you know, large sweeps of the marketplace as well as evaluating apps before they're released. <laughs> uh, thank you for the great talk. I have two quick questions. Uh, at Enigma earlier, I think someone asked you about iOS development and you said it was something you were working on. <laughs> so I was just wondering if there was an update on that. Yeah. 
Um, so I, I gave a version of this, I guess, well, that was a different talk. I had Enigma last year on, um, we first started looking at this through the lens of children's apps um, and looking at violations of, of COPPA. Um, and yes, yeah, someone asked about iOS. Uh, we, uh, we've made progress since then. Uh, we, we have a internal version that we've been testing uh, where we can, so basically the difference is on, on Android, since we have all the hooks, um, it's easy to reverse engineer the apps as well as to see you know, what obfuscations they're doing because we have the OS level instrumentation. So I talked about doing you know, the set minus where we look at apps sending the data minus the apps that have the permission to see you know, which ones are sending data without the permission. Most of what we're relying on is actually the opposite of that and looking at you know, what are the apps that access the data, um, but then we don't see sending it, which suggests that they're obfuscating it in somehow. Um, and so you know, that's readily detectable through the OS level instrumentation, then we go in, you know, write rules for the new obfuscations that we detect and then can, you know, detect it in the future at scale. But most of this relies on the fact that, you know, Android and iOS, the third party SDKs are hitting the same API endpoints um, and are generally in the same format. So once we detect the obfuscation un under Android, on iOS, we can look at just the, at the traffic level to see you know, what it's doing now that we know how to you know, de-obfuscate uh, the different flows, um, because on iOS, we don't have the OS level instrumentation. Awesome. Thank you so much. And then a quick other question. Um, I've accessed your website a lot since I first learned about oh. it, and I think it overall is really great, but there was one or two apps that I couldn't find on there. Is there any way that the public could in some way contribute to <laughs> automating that. Yeah, way. so uh, we, we haven't been actively maintaining the, the public website since we've been mostly working on the, the, the product um, internally, uh, but one of the things that's definitely on the roadmap is one, revamping the website um, and you know, having access to a little bit more data, uh, but also one thing that we're planning, you know, I, I don't know when, but at some point we want a client app so that people, you know, consumers, can then you know, just look up the apps that they have on their phone, see the information in one place, and then potentially add new apps to, you know, to the repository if we don't have them. So one of the first things that I heard you say was that uh, Xiaomi was one of the major violators of side channel attacks. And uh, Xiaomi is China's leader in wearables and a mobile phone provider. And then you immediately transitioned to Baidu, which is China's largest search <laughs> provider, <laughs> being a major violator of side channel attacks as well. So I guess the natural question for that is, do you see a trend in origin in <laughs> <laughs> um, honestly no uh, i mean those are those are big names, but there are a lot of smaller ones that we've seen that are you know sdks that i hadn't previously heard of that are then in a surprisingly large number of apps and are doing bad things too um, I don't know. There's a lot of bad stuff out there. I, it's hard to, I mean, you know, there, there are two cases of two big Chinese companies, sure. I mean, I guess the difference is, well, no, that's not, I was going to say, like, you know, the, 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 the really, you know, large, you know, it, by and large, the really bad stuff, like collecting, you know, like location data or, I don't know, you know, the, the, the really out there things happens with, you know, relatively small apps that most people have never heard of. Um, but that's not to say that, you know, we haven't seen a lot of bad stuff happening with Google and Facebook too. So I'm, I, I don't know. There's, yeah, it, it's, hard to, it's hard to answer that. So a lot of people are doing um, cross-platform development using Flutter these days. And so does that pose any additional risks people using Flutter to develop for both iOS and Android? Uh, I haven't looked at that one in particular, but I assume it's pretty similar to Unity, which yeah, I have looked at. I mean, you know, so Unity relies on lots of native libraries in order to, you know, to, to do, you know, to make it cross-platform. Um, and I suspect it's probably the same thing, is that, you know, in the native code, there are probably lots of ways of circumventing, you know, the, the data that's protected by the, you know, the platform APIs. I, I don't know about iOS specifically, but all the stuff that I've seen that's available to native code that, you know, is outside the permission system on Android, it wouldn't surprise me if there's a, there's a ton of stuff there. 
So, Serge, a great presentation. Thanks. Um, the, uh, one of the, so the site, the, I think the gist of what I got from what you were saying is that a lot of these site channels are supervised recalls that shouldn't happen in the first place, and the APIs pretty much sort of act as the sort of firewall, right? And if that is the case, what I did not understand is, why couldn't you have statically looked at this, right? You could have recursed through the libraries and seen, and, and you can see if there are supervised recalls being made, right, within the code. Why did you say that you had to do this only through sort of the dynamic analysis? Oh, I, I mean, that's easy, because when doing it statically, you have to come up with some hypothesis for how it's doing it, that it is doing this, and having some hypothesis for how it might be doing it so that you can then go through the code to see if it's doing it in this way that you thought it might be. So instead of doing that, the, the easier you know, way is we can you know, take a shortcut and just look at what apps are you know, sending data outside the permission system, which we assume then is because they're exploiting some side channel, and then we can you know, flag all of those apps um, because it's, you know, we're looking for needles in haystacks. Um, so once we've identified the apps that are clearly violating the rules somehow, then we can manually go in and, and take a look how they're doing it. I've got one. What does Google say about all this? <laughs> um, that, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, so they were, they fixed a bunch of the things in Android Q, um, though that was after they first ignored them. Um, yeah, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know. There are a lot of issues. Um, and I, I don't know what their internal deliberations are. I mean, we reported, you know, in the Enigma talk a year ago, I, you know, prior to that, I had reported a bunch of stu bad stuff in children's apps to them that was clearly violating federal law, and their response was, oh, we, we don't believe these apps that are in the children's category are directed at children. Uh, and then when it, there was a, you know, New York Times article and a state AG sued them, they then, you know, you know, released a public response saying our previous, you know, our, our previous message to the, the researcher was in error. Of course, we take privacy very seriously. Um, and then they, you know, reprioritized the ticket for this research from like P4 to P0 the week after that happened. Um, so, I mean, that, that's been my limited experience. <laughs> Um, so, um, from the screens, what I had seen is you forked the Android, which is available open source, and then you done the test, right? So, how about, uh, for example, Xiaomi uh, OnePlus One, they actually ship with their own version of Android. Yep. How vulnerable is the, 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 not the app, but the operating system in your phone? I don't know. I, I haven't, you know, I haven't looked at their operating system, because obviously we don't have the source to it. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, all of this is made possible by the fact that we're doing this at the OS level. Um, so, you know, we, we can capture all the traffic regardless of whether it's, you know, being pinned or not. Um, and so, we, you know, we're able to see everything, but that's only because we're at the OS level. So if, you know, if you have a modified version of the OS, there's a lot of stuff you could do. Are you, are you the one that ruined YouTube? <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what do you mean? <laughs> I, I made it. I, I, I'm the one who's making it difficult for influencers to monetize children. <laughs> for the for the children's channels, yeah, on YouTube. Um, I, it's hard to answer that. <laughs> it's okay. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Serge. Thanks. Next up, we have Chaitanya from our host, eBay. Okay. 
All right, a lot of great, great talks, presentation today. Uh, so hello, everyone. My name is Chaitanya. Uh, I'm AppSec engineer here at eBay. Uh, I have a master's in computer engineering. I've been doing threat modeling at my previous organizations, even at eBay. Uh, coffee enthusiast, not that I can be bribed for a good coffee, but more than happy to talk about it offline. Uh, coming back to OASP. So before I talk my presentation, um, quick question. How many of you here have been doing, or in the past, or at, at this moment, doing threat modeling? How many threat modelers in the house? Awesome, okay, okay, awesome, this is gonna be fun. So we have a lot of things to cover. Uh, we'll talk about some conventional threat modeling frameworks, uh, the relevance, uh, we'll introduce some new way, some customizable way how you can create your own threat modeling framework and how that can be adapted. Um, so beginning with what is threat modeling and why do we need it? So threat modeling is an art. It's an art of foreseeing threats in a lot earlier stage. With the right security mindset and right data points, you can foresee it in a lot earlier stages. But in order to understand why do we do threat modeling, we have been doing threat modeling for a while, uh, what's the need of it? Why do we do it? I have to take a step back and explain you how this all security thing started. In a lot earlier stage, our secure, our regular SDLC, software development life cycle, looked something like this at a very high level. Requirement stage, design stage, coding, testing, and deploying. Security stepped in, said, we want to be embedded at each and every stage. So how do we do that? And that's when security stepped in, said, hey, we'll do security requirement gathering during the requirement stage. We'll do threat modeling during the design stage. We'll do SaaS and open source security and in your design phases, uh, coding phases. We'll do DAST in your testing phases. So slowly, security was able to gel well into the SDLC lifecycle. And then came the era of Agile, an iterative, a circular model. And what security did was we took the first and last part of our SSDLC joined them together, and we started calling this a kind of an agile security model. Do you see a problem here? If not, we'll talk about it in our subsequent slides. But I'm not here to talk about SDLC. I'm here to talk about threat modeling. There are around 12 threat modeling frameworks existing in the market. Everyone uses what fits them. Uh, some of the organization I have heard, they have been using still some traditional way of threat modeling, which have been introduced around 15 to 20 years, or maybe even older than that, not sure. But I'm not here to explain or create 13th framework. I'm here to explain the relevance of it and help you create your own version of threat modeling, which is right for your organization. If you guys representing here, if you guys are representing 10 organizations, I want you guys to go back and create your own version of threat modeling, which is right suited for your organization. Some of the very prominent famous threat modeling frameworks, STRIDE, the name is an acronym of spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of uh, service, and elevation of privileges. This came in, this was something that came from Microsoft, was very widely adopted. I know few organizations still using it. But my question is, is it still relevant? Is it still relevant in the changing landscape scenarios where we often start, we have started seeing bot attacks? We have been seeing attacks on, due to open source libraries. I don't think so. In an organization which has which spends more time discussing on the classification of the threat. A privilege escalation, sometimes people feel this could be more into the spoofing side, some feel this could be in the tampering side, so 
Threat modelers and developers spend more time discussing the classification of, uh, of your threat rather than actually fixing the threat. DREAD is the second framework. DREAD is also an acronym that is, that is a risk rating framework that was created. Often people use it along with STRIDE. So STRIDE is to identify the attack threats and DREAD is used to classify them uh, and rate a right risk around it. The problem with DREAD was again that it, it, it has, it has a cross-functional, cross uh, the, the categories have been defined in such a way that you will be spending more time just uh, rating it and classifying it in such a way that half of the team feeling this could lead to more of a damage and half of the team feeling this is more of an uh, affected user ratio. So, and this leads ends, ends up nowhere. The last one is FASTA, which is a risk-centric approach. Uh, it stands for Process for Attack Simulation and Threat Analysis. Um, some people feel this is attack-centric, some people feel this is risk-centric, but uh, I'm, I'm more inclined towards risk-centric approach on this framework. This is a seven-step framework that was created. The problem with this framework is it's not scalable. In an organization where you get more than 1,000 requests for threat modeling, a seven-step process such as FASTA might not work well, or especially in an agile environment. So my question is, are they relevant? In an agile world where there's an iterative approach from the development side, where thousands of requests are coming to you, in a world where we are seeing attacks like MageCard and open source vulnerable libraries causing breach like a big massive organization, do you think these frameworks could actually fly well? I don't think so. And that is why the aim of this presentation is to create a customizable framework which rightly fits your organization. So this is where comes OWASP-based threat modeling approach. The building block, the fundamental for this framework comes into three pieces. Your policy. Each and every organization has an InfoSec policy. The InfoSec policy for an e-commerce company might be different for, from a manufacturing company. Every company has a different risk appetite and how much of how much of a security, which, which are the top security, what are the top priority, priority for you? Try to identify that. So on top of that policy, security team creates a security standard. Now this security standard is nothing but what you actually want to achieve on top of the policy. And the third, the top piece of this building block is the controls. The controls are nothing but recommendations, the fixes that you give to your product teams. And using these three, this becomes more clear in my next slide uh, when I give an example. So company policy, access control policy is what uh, my organization wants to achieve. How do I achieve this? I make sure I've created a standard called authorization. So what is the right control for authorization that can be achieved using stricter scopes, least privilege accesses, and revoking access after usage. Now these controls can go even more strict based on how critical the application is. The more critical application, I can go more strict onto the control. And the beauty of this framework is you can always update it, you can always upgrade it based on the changes in your company policy. You can add more standards and controls. So keeping all these InfoSec policies into consideration and understanding some of the very common threats that are actually added in your policy, we came up with a very, very generic standards. So this is something that you guys can take it from here, which is the security standards. I'm not asking everyone to use exactly these standards, but these standards mostly covers uh, most of the organization's InfoSec policies pretty well. So these 12 security standards is what we will achieve and this is what we've, it will help me to get to the um, InfoSec policy. The entire automation 
is against those bot attacks that we are seeing, authentication, authorization, browser security. It includes all those security controls that browsers are capable of. Um, uh, compliance, configuration management, which is configuration management is coming out of um, security misconfiguration, one of the OWASP top tens. Uh, there is cryptographic controls that involves all the crypto related recommendations. There is data management that involves all the recommendations related to my backend database calls and database services. And uh, there's input validation, manipulation, uh, logging, and known vulnerability is nothing but open source related uh, vulnerabilities. One thing to observe here is, unlike Stride, Dread, Pasta, um, or any other framework, I am not giving out names like CSRF or anything which developers are not familiar with. The beauty of this framework is it is very developer friendly. It's very customer friendly. Rather than me telling my product teams, go and fix CSRF, and team coming back to me saying, what is CSRF? What is cross-site scripting? I don't know. Rather, rather than giving out OWASP top 10 list, I'm giving them OWASP top 10 mitigation list. What is that they should be doing, rather than what is that is wrong in the code? So I'm actually asking them to, to fix, giving them the direction to fix, and that is what actually threat modeling is supposed to do, right? So if there is, if I see there is a potential cross-site scripting in an application, my recommendation goes around input validation and manipulation, right? Or if I want them to add CSP, uh, which is a browser functionality, I ask them to include browser security components. So rather than throwing out security terms onto them, I'm actually helping them. I'm making it more developer friendly for them. So with this, standards in place, what are the changes in the process? Actually, it doesn't change the process at all. You still go with your requirement and gathering process. You onboard with all your initial data. You identify and discover, you identify the scopes. You decompose the application and identify all the entry points, exit points. You try to do similar divide and conquer like just like any other threat modeling framework does. This is where it changes. You apply a PSC model. So PSC model, as I said, policy standards and controls. This is where you apply this model. Your control actually helps you giving out the recommendation. And finally, you give out the list of, you can do a final readout session with the developer, development team. And this becomes very much easier, very much convenient for everyone to understand what is the next step from here. So we have done the process. What's the next step from here? Risk identifying the risk associated with all the threats. This is an o, this is OWASP risk rating framework, what OWASP has offered, but I'm not here to vouch for it. Because again, coming back to the main topic of my presentation, this is an agile world. This method might not fly. An application that has come to me for my first round of review comes back to me next month with an iteration, second round. Second, second endpoint being introduced, third endpoint being introduced. Can I actually split them and do a separate risk rating onto them? I don't think so. That's why I need an additional column here. If I want my framework to survive in an agile environment, I have to keep track of an existing residual risk. And that is why you might have seen the severity might have been bumped up. With an existing risk along with the newly introduced risk, we, we will be able to bump up the severity of these bugs. Now, the similar approach can be applied to Dread if you are using, if you are using CVSS framework or any other risk rating framework. A similar approach can be applied to that to identify the right risk for the application. A simple example, an application that came to me for the first time it had authorization issue. I made it high. I have rated the risk associated authorization as high. Next month, the same team comes back to me by introducing a front end piece to it. Now with this authorization available in their back end system, I'm actually opening up doors to insecure direct object references. Now this becomes a critical one. 
I cannot put it high because an application was already high in my previous version of review. In an agile world, I have to keep an eye. I have to make sure this is an, it, this is an incremental change and must be rated wisely in, by keeping into consideration my residual risk. So this is with the risk. So we have introduced, we have created some very interesting standard. We have been able to do threat modeling. We have, we have done the risk part, everything well. But my question to you is, how do you measure the success of this program? Are you sure you'll be able to answer the question if I ask you what are the 10 biggest threat your organization has? You have been doing thousands of threat modeling. If I ask you what are the top five risk, most risky products, risky services your organization has? How do you prioritize threat modeling requests? How do you scale up to 1,000 plus requests? So to answer that, we came up with an idea of a missing piece, an idea of a tool called threat surfing, which is what complements this framework. So you have your customized framework, your PSC model framework, along with this tool that helps you achieve that missing piece. It's nothing but helping you achieve the feedback model from each and every stage. Because one question that you might all be asking, how do I keep a track of the residual risk? The one that I showed in my previous slide. If you want to achieve that, we need a kind of a tool that keeps track of all these residual risk. So how does threat surfing look like? So threat surfing is a very simple tool. Uh, it basically has an onboarding portal. Uh, the product teams would be coming on to that. Um, will fill up some basic information. It's more like a chatbot that helps you onboard to give a rough idea about how this application looks like. Um, when you apply that information along with your PSC model, the PSC engine, which is, which is what will be different for each, each and every organization, would actually lead to a threat modeling portal. This portal can be used by anyone. Could be your CISO, if he wants to see the threat landscape of your organization, could be used by an auditor to see how many applications are being reviewed on a yearly basis, can be used by security engineers to know what are the top priority one tickets in my queue and how should I be addressing them, what are the basic information available, have they been reviewed in the past or is it a brand new application that is coming to me. So this portal, would help you give all that kind of visibility. And this is what will perfectly complement your framework. So at a very high level, um, your onboarding application portal would look something like this, where the teams would be coming, a chatbot would help you onboard onto the application very well. Uh, and once you onboard, the final output, and this is more like a wireframe that we have created on the test data. And this has nothing to do with uh, eBay's data. But uh, uh, this is more like a wireframe that comes out of the portal uh, that explains you the organizational threat landscape. So the red line that you see helps you create a baseline, and the blue bar graphs that you see is your current trend of threats that you have seen. And all these bar graphs are the security standards that we created in the previous slide. So these security standards, it actually helps you understand what is the biggest threat that your organization is currently seeing. You're seeing more of a browser security and data management related issues compared to last year. Right? This information can be used by your training team in order to accommodate and use how you should be changing your training data because this is the kind of a mistake that you're seeing from the product teams. So you should be training more on data management and browser security side of it. So this data can be used there. This data can actually be used to identify where are we doing good, where are we doing bad, and this is the final output from that. So the key takeaways from this presentation, focus on top 10 mitigations rather than OWASP top 10 attacks. Rather than giving out security jargons onto the developer, development teams, always focus on how should they fix it. Don't let them figure out, don't let product teams figure out how they should be fixing a cross-site scripting. Rather, 
after understanding the application, after understanding the architecture, it's our duty, it's our job to explain them the right way to actually fix an application. Threat modeling can be brains of secure SDLC process. And this visibility can be achieved if your framework is rightly complemented by a tool such as threat surfing. And my last and final key takeaway, don't follow the trend blindly. Do what is best for your organization. Just because everyone is using Stride, I should not be using Stride. I get to ask myself, is it actually right for my organization? I don't think so. And that's how one day we all gathered and started creating our own framework which is perfectly right for eBay or perfectly right for your organization. So with this, just end my presentation. Thank you very much if you have any questions. Is this a new working group? No. Will this be a working group? Uh, we, I don't know that. I don't know, but maybe we can probably talk to us too. Hi, uh, great talk, thank you. Um, I'm interested with Agile process, so there are various points you can jump in and the right model, and as products evolve through various sprints, uh, the threats could evolve as well. Correct. Uh, where is your inject point into the process? Are you coming in at every sprint and doing threat modeling? So this is a, this is a very good question, actually. Um, it's, uh, the teams, the product teams, often like likes to involve threat modeling team right into the requirement stage. So if there is a planning for the next sprint where they're planning to add the whole new endpoint to it or revamping the application, you often get into their, not every sprint, but maybe alternate sprints where they have a massive, some major release coming up. So I think having that kind of residual information and, and the past information, this, this actually helps you a lot. Okay. Okay, we all are hungry. All right. Thank you, Chitana. Thank you very Maybe. much.